Thanks for coming to the early morning talk. It's always hard to uh, follow the conference dinner, but glad to see there's these few people here. Um, and um, so uh, this is the title of today's talk. Um, uh, I guess, you know, I was asked to talk about this topic, um, and so that's why I'm talking about it. Um, this is not um, new work, uh, although it just appeared in publication, so it actually appeared, I think, uh, maybe 10 days ago or so. On. So, um, so the topic of today is to really understand the question, or at least ask the question, whether there's evidence of uh, large, in other words, exponential quantum advantage uh, in uh, quantum chemistry. Um, it's, it's quite possible some of you have seen me uh, talk about this before, or have uh, read or heard a little bit about this work. Um, if so, um, I'm hoping that, my, in my experience, there's been some misunderstandings about um, what this paper actually says. And so um, it's my hope that in this talk, I will maybe say things a little bit differently and perhaps clarify uh, some of the points that have been uh, misunderstood. <clears throat> OK, I shall point out that there's a long list of co-authors, um, as often is in, these, in papers in the quantum information field. And you see many of these co-authors appearing um, um, all the co-authors appearing in this line here, and in fact, some of them are in this room. OK, um, so I'll just uh, start by saying, of course, quantum chemistry has been uh, one of the motivating applications uh, in quantum computing. Um, and, and one of the reasons why it's, it's considered a, a motivating application is because there's uh, some hope, or there, there has been some hope, that there's a large uh, gain to be had uh, by using uh, quantum computers to solve uh, quantum chemistry problems. Uh, in particular, there has been some, um, some expectations that there is an exponential speed up uh, for the quantum chemistry problem. Um, so to examine this, uh, we have to define what quantum chemistry is. Um, and uh, for the context of this, in the context of this talk, I'll be defining quantum chemistry uh, to be the problem of computing the ground state of a particular Hamiltonian, uh, namely the Hamiltonian of the uh, electrons uh, in a molecule. Now, to be clear, quantum chemists do, do many things. Um, and it's not only true that they compute ground states, but, um, but computing the ground state is by, by far the most important task uh, that quantum chemists do. Um, and it's because you can get many, many things from the ground state energy. You can get the re reaction energy. You can get the st relative stability of different material phases, for example. If you compute the energy as a function of uh, where the nuclei are, then you obtain something called the potential energy surface, and that determines the rate of the reaction, the kinetics of the reaction. Um, and in the cases when you do want to study the excited states of the system in a spectroscopy experiment, almost always the initial state is the ground state that you are kicking the system out of, and so the ground state is the starting point for spectroscopy. OK, so, so to turn this into a problem that can be analyzed more easily from a complexity analysis, then we have to discretize it. So we'll introduce a basis. And the size of this um, single particle basis, whose tensor product forms the Hilbert space of the problem, uh, we'll call L. OK, so L will be the problem size. Um, and we're going to consider the complexity as a function of this problem size. Um, and when we increase L in this talk, increase the basis, we will do it by increasing uh, the number of atoms. So when I talk about uh, the complexity as a function of L, it's really as a function of the system size. You have more atoms, the Hilbert space is larger. Okay, so, so the question we want to understand is the complexity of computing the ground states of this Hamiltonian as a function of L uh, for something that I will call uh, generic uh, molecules and materials. And I will clarify what generic means later on. OK. Um, so how do we obtain a quantum advantage? Well, um, well, first I'll just clarify that I'll be talking about fault-tolerant quantum advantage. So you know, assume quantum computers are ready, uh, error corrected. Um, and so then it's important to um, recognize that advantage is a ratio of costs. Okay, so there are two contributions to advantage. Um, uh, this ratio of costs is a cost of the quantum algorithm to compute the ground state. And then the denominator is a, is a classical work, cost of the classical work. Um, and to have a large or exponential quantum advantage, um, then this ratio or, uh, or the speed up um, should be very large. In particular, um, the quantum algorithm should, um, as a function of system size, get faster and faster relative to the classical algorithm. And if the growth rate is exponential, then we have exponential quantum advantage. Now, because of the ratio of costs, you can, of course, get a ratio by d 
manipulating the numerator and the denominator in various ways. Um, so the specific way in which uh, we're going to, uh, the specific hypothesis about the form of this ratio is going to be this. So we're going to assume um, that this exponential speed up is obtained um, by the quantum algorithm taking a polynomial amount of time and the classical algorithm uh, taking an exponential amount of time uh, to reach a certain precision, epsilon, or in some cases, and not really very many in this specific talk, a certain relative precision, epsilon bar, which is just a precision divided by the system size. Okay, so, so, um, so more formally, we're looking for the evidence to support this particular ratio of costs uh, in the ground state uh, quantum chemistry problem. Okay. Um, so at this point, let me just clarify uh, what I mean by this mysterious word generic. Um, and um, and the, the basic observation is that if I don't limit the types of problems that we're going to study in some way, uh, then exponential quantum advantage of the form that I described uh, is not uh, strictly possible. Um, and the reason is, you know, I assume the quantum ratio of this form here, where I have a polynomial for the quantum algorithm and exponential on the denominator. Um, but as should be well known to this audience, you know, quantum ground state determination is in QMA. So we know that there exist instances of ground states uh, that you cannot uh, easily determine on a quantum computer. Um, the, the physical sort of idea behind there existing these hard ground states is because you can have glassy problems. So glassy problems are one where, ones where sort of the ground states at different system sizes are completely unrelated, right? So if you had just change the system size by one atom, you get a completely different ground state. Um, so for the purpose of this talk, there will be nothing to talk about if I allowed this class of problems. Um, and so we're going to assume that the chemistry that we're trying to solve uh, just excludes such problems. Um, so either there are additional uh, restrictions on the, on the set of problems we can consider, uh, or, there are additional, or there's additional information um, about the ground state, uh, so that in practice, uh, you can always find it uh, easily uh, on the quantum computer. Um, so the rub of this is that if you now introduce this restriction, um, then you have to ask uh, whether this additional information uh, can be used in a heuristic fashion, also in a classical algorithm. Um, and so essentially, you know, the reason why there's an interesting problem to study is that there's this uh, now slightly more subtle question of what the cost of quantum algorithms are for a restricted class of problems uh, versus classical heuristics, which are allowed to use this additional information uh, to solve the problem. Okay. Um, so I would just now just say a, a couple things about quantum algorithms, just uh, roughly what the complexity, the type class of quantum algorithms and, and the complexity is. Um, I'll say a little bit about classical heuristics, and then we'll just look at some numerical evidence at the ratio of costs uh, in a range of systems and then draw some conclusions. So that's essentially how we'll proceed. Okay, so, um, so there, there's of course more than one quantum algorithm to determine uh, the ground state energy. Um, but you know, a good example is still this classic algorithm where uh, state preparation costs quantum phase estimation, which has the following uh, steps, right? So you, you can prepare an approximate ground, you first prepare approximate ground states, um, then you do a projected measurement, you do phase estimation. Nowadays, you might do something more fancy like QSVT, but you know, it doesn't really change what I'm going to say uh, too much. Um, and then there's a projected measurement, so you, you get some eigenstate, it might be the ground state. If not, you have to repeat the, repeat the experiment until you uh, succeed. Um, so because there's a, there's, so the success probability is an, is an important component, and, and that depends on the overlap between your initial state and, and the ground state that uh, you determine. So, so the total form of the costs um, generally has this form uh, for all, all fault-tolerant quantum algorithms for this problem. Uh, so there's a part that is associated with the second piece. Okay, so here would be the sort of Hamiltonian simulation in phase estimation has a polynomial dependence on system size. Um, and all this has to re be repeated many times because of the success probability, and that depends on one of the overlap in, in some way. And, and like I say, you know, this, this, this form, which I've written in some imp not in a very general way, just polynomials of something, um, can be used to describe other four tolerant algorithms. So, when examined as a function of system size, it's, it's obviously clear that there is a polynomial piece, right, in phase estimation. This is the Hamiltonian circuit. Um, but there's this, this other piece, which is the success probability, 
Um, and the success probability also has a dependence on system size in general because the Hilbert space size grows with system size. And if your Hilbert space is very large, then without any additional information, it's rather hard to find the ground state, right? So, so in principle, the overlap could become exponentially small. Um, but it's important to remember, this is the sort of first misconception people have when they just read the title of the paper and do not read the paper, uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, we, we're not really considering any of the cases where state preparation is hard. You know, by definition, we're excluding those cases. Okay? So we're going to assume that molecules have additional information where state preparation e is easy. Okay? So, so the, the question we're considering is, has nothing to do with the exponential difficulty of state preparation in the worst case in chemistry. Okay. Um, so, um, so the key thing, though, nonetheless remains this, this factor here, because that's where all the uncertainty is, right? I mean, obviously, you know, um, so uh, then in this case, we put restrictions, so we know that this, this is, is not going to be exponentially small. But the question then is, under these restrictions, that quantum state preparation is easy, uh, then do classical heuristics uh, also work? OK. Um, so, so, so to proceed further, let me just say so what, what, what one might, might do in state preparation. Okay, so, um, so the simplest thing you might consider is just to guess what the answer is classically. Okay, so you classically prepare some approximate state and then implement the preparation on the quantum computer. Um, it, so it's clear in this process that you, you need to, we want to prepare a good state, okay, so one that has some good overlap. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want it to solve the problem, right? So you don't want to prepare a state that is, is good, but also uh, solves the energy to, so, to some, some particular precision, desired precision. Um, so, so in essence, you can have sort of two sorts of scenarios, one of which is good for EQA. So one is where the good one would be if you could choose some simple classical heuristic that we all agree doesn't actually solve the problem to the precision you want, okay? So that might just be like mean field theory. Um, and then observe that its overlap is, is generally good as a function of system size. Okay? Maybe it decays kind of slowly. So, so if this occurs, then, it, you know, then EQA is, is something that's possible. Um, but you know, the, the bad scenario is when you know, your classical heuristic has, this sort of, has a rapid decay of the overlap with system size. Um, and then you might choose other heuristics, which might be sort of better than mean field theory, and they improve the decay. Um, but as you improve the decay, they end up solving the problem. Okay, so that would sort of obviously negate the EQA. Okay, so the question to examine is, you know, are we really in the left-hand left case or in the right-hand case uh, for uh, generic chem uh, chemical uh, problems? Um, another state preparation strategy is adiabatic state preparation. Um, there you, you start with some initial Hamiltonian, H, H in it here, and then slowly change it to the final Hamiltonian, and if you change it at some particular speed, which is relatively slow, uh, then you end up in the approximate uh, ground state of the final Hamiltonian. Um, the rate at which you would want to go has to, is essentially related to the gap you encounter along the adiabatic path. So you should go sort of at some rate that's inversely proportional to the gap. Um, and it's clear that f for this to succeed, then the gap cannot be too small. OK. So, so some heuristics generally has to go into adiabatic state preparation because you know, how do you ensure that the gap, you, know, you don't know the gap a priori, so how do I ensure that the gap doesn't get too small? Um, and in general, we again have uh, a couple of scenarios. Uh, some of, so the first one, which is good for EQA, is that if I consider the space of all kinds of ways to set up this Hamiltonian, I'm not going to define the measure on the space, but I imagine this vaguely this, this, this set of paths, um, then if in some sense, you know, you pick almost any path, you know, then, then on average it leads to this, uh, this, this uh, uh, type of protected gap, then, then this is obviously very favorable for EQA. Um, but what would be bad for EQA is if that you have to sort of, you know, actually hunt for these paths and, and the good paths are perhaps rare or require like some very complicated information or heuristics to find. Um, and, and then in that case, you know, you have to give a lot of information and you can use that information classically. Now, now, when you're on the second side, you know, one diagnostic that you are really in this scenario and not this scenario is that your, the, the, the gap you, you do encounter the path or the time you need to prepare the state really varies strongly depending on whether you start, you know, at this point or at this point in the past days. Um, and so from the worst case, which is what you encounter in sort of adiabatic algorithms applied to Grover search, uh, then the, then the uh, size of the gap 
uh, looks a little again an, looks a little bit like an overlap. So so it looks a little it, like in, it's inversely proportional to the overlap between the initial ground state uh, and the desired ground state. Okay, um, and so in a, in any case, to summarize, you know the question of of state of age of act state preparation EQA here is really a question of whether you can easily choose paths without employing heuristics which involve solving the problem. Okay. So then let's just say a little bit about classical heuristics. I've got to speed up a little bit. Okay, so the many classical heuristics, um, won't go through all of them. Generally, they apply to different problems. Uh, so this is now problem space, and they're sort of carved up by the different heuristics. And you might expect that, you know, comparing the complexity of quantum uh, algorithms to classical heuristics is just comparing two known costs. Um, but much of the subtlety of this question is associated with the fact that we actually don't know the cost of classical heuristics. Um, so, we all know that they're designed, I mean, all the methods that I've written up here, they're designed to execute in, um, in polynomial time. Okay, that's, you sort of set them up that way. Um, but because they're heuristics, you don't know the error, right? And so if you don't know the error, you can't really compare these two complexities. Um, the only way to establish the error is to do it empirically, which you can do by just running it in many, many problems, and then you get some empirical version of the uh, precision scaling. Okay, so, but usually this knowledge is just not present in the literature and classical heuristics. Okay, so, so, the, so the key question to answer to, to understand quantum advantage on the classical side is to understand the cost to achieve a given precision in the class of heuristics. And so that's really um, much of the work that we had to do. Okay, so what's the cost um, of a classical heuristic if we target specific precision? Okay, so, so roughly the analysis go like this, you know, so, um, First, we examine whether simple classical heuristics, like in ANSAT state preparation and age back state preparation, whether they work. If yes, then that's, you know, that's very favorable for EQA. It doesn't prove that it exists, but it's sort of probably a necessary condition. Um, uh, if it doesn't work, sorry, I mean, it's a probably a sufficient condition. I mean, so um, then you might need to examine some improved classical heuristics, and then you need to carefully check whether they solve the problem, right? So, so if they sort of don't solve the problem and they give good overlap, then basically you have EQA. Um, and then finally, of course, if you establish that these improved classical heuristics that you need to use solve the problem, then you don't have EQA, right? So that's roughly it. Okay, so I'll go very quickly through some, uh, some data, uh, very, very quickly. Um, um, first, we'll study some data about state preparation, then some data about classical heuristics. Okay, so for ANSAT state preparation, we, we just studied a class of systems. These are RNN-Sulfur clusters and looked at whether a simple heuristic like uh, start taking a mean field state yields a good overlap with the ground state. Um, and you obtain graphs like this, which show the plot of the overlap versus uh, the system size. And it's a log linear plot, and you have this linear dependence. Um, and so, perhaps unsurprisingly to, to many people, uh, the over, but surprising to some, you know, the overlap decreases exponentially with system size to uh, very small values. Okay. So, so that just suggests that, you know, the hope that a simple one-shot heuristic yields a very good overlap across, a, across system sizes, you know, all system sizes, is, you know, obviously too optimistic. Um, and then one needs to consider uh, improved classical heuristics and then check whether they solve the problem. Okay. Um, the second is to look at adiabatic state preparation. And, and here's a sort of complicated graph. Uh, but what, all it shows is that the, is the estimate of the time you need to adiabatic keep the state prepare uh, as a function of many different types of starting points. Um, and there's a kind of linear relationship here. And this quantity on the bottom is actually this, this overlap that appears in, uh, in the adiabatic growth research. Um, and so you see that the adiabatic pre state preparation time, what's happened to my slide? Something happened. Oh, it's not, okay. It just says PowerPoint is not responding, which is, uh, I guess, is sort of obvious. Uh, wait for the program to respond, it tells me. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, restart the program. Okay. All right, let's see. All right, so something happened. Okay, so it responded. Okay. Um, and now I have my, some blue thing. Okay, now it's not responding. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see. So, okay, all right. So it somehow it just didn't like the slide. Um, and so the adiabatic state preparation time uh, um, actually looks like roughly like one over this initial overlap squared. And so it just shows that 
in this in this class of problem design software classes, there's a very strong dependence on the initial state, you know, rather like constructed search. Um, and in general, to get a good state preparation time, you have to more or less solve the problem. So you have one of these small times here, um, the problem has just 12 orbitals. You have to diagonalize Hamiltonian within, say, 10 or 11 of them um, before you get a good state preparation time. Um, so, okay. Um, and, so, uh, and so finally, let's just look at the cost of some classical heuristics. Um, and uh, so what we established is that very simple state preparation strategies don't work, and so you need to use sort of improved state preparation strategies, ones which, which involve improved classical heuristics, and then we have to check whether they just sort of actually yield the precision you want. Um, and so we did this in two classes of systems. So one is sort of organic molecules and biomolecules, and we asked, you know, what's the empirical precision scaling of these problems? And one finds that, for example, in these classes of uh, systems where we employ the particular approximation coupled cluster theory, um, that if you look at the computational cost versus the error of the uh, algorithm on this log-log uh, um, plot, you see a linear uh, line. So in fact, these heuristics have polynomial dependence on the inverse precision. Um, and it's then rel relatively easy to check and be sort of, sort of by design that they have polynomial cost uh, with system size. Okay, so, so in this class of problems, uh, these improved heuristics that would generate states with good overlap actually have this poly L, poly 1 over epsilon uh, type uh, uh, complexity. And as a last point, uh, going very quickly, we run out of time, we can check that the same is true for strongly correlated models. Here I used Heisenberg and Hubbard models as examples. Um, and we used a heuristic uh, approach, tensor networks, but others could be used. Uh, and one can verify that they have a polynomial dependence on system size. Uh, in the execution, so by, um, and uh, under the same sort of approximation strategies, they yield a polynomial uh, inverse precision dependence. Okay, so, uh, so to summarize, um, you know, the, the real way to think about quantum advantage in quantum chemistry uh, is to consider, you know, the set of problems where state preparation is easy, and then, you know, the, the task then to check is whether classical heuristics uh, that allow state preparation are um, exponentially hard. Uh, we don't find evidence that this is true, or this scenario occurs. Um, and so for that reason, it's, I think, reasonable to assume that EQA is not usually available um, for this type of problem. Um, one may need some sort of very fine-tuned uh, example for this to happen. Um, the take-home message, I would just to add a couple points, is that, I mean, you know, EQA is not necessary for quantum computers to be useful. So if fault-tolerant quantum computers were here tomorrow, I'd be a very happy user. Gonna, they will definitely be useful in some way. Um, but if EQA is being used to justify the development of quantum computers and EQA in quantum chemistry is being used to justify the development of quantum computers, then you know, maybe that statement should be reassessed. Okay. Um, we should certainly expect polynomial speedups. There's sort of lots of evidence that this occurs. Um, heuristics and, and the quantum level should be explored and the classical level empirical error scaling should be better studied. And so that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Jarnett, for a very um, insightful talk. Are there any questions? Thanks very much. Uh, very, very nice talk. And I, I think it's a really important work, actually. Um, but one thing um, um, I'd like clarified, if that's OK. Um, so you mentioned that uh, uh, earlier on in your talk, you mentioned that uh, EQA is not specifically about the difficulty of state preparation in quantum chemistry. Oh, uh, well, I just meant that sometimes people, if you just say, is exponential quantum advantage in quantum chemistry, uh, the immediate response is, oh, well, we all know that blah, 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 that it's in QMA, so I don't understand why this problem's being considered or something. So I'm just saying that, you know, it's not, that's not the problem that's being studied, like the QMA hardness of the problem. But, but what I was kind of conf a little bit confused about is that earlier on, again, you mentioned that this... Um, quantum ratio, which kind of, uh, as far as I understand, represents the specific claim that the polynomial cost of quantum algorithms over the exponential cost of classical is, uh, tell me if I've misunderstood, that's impossible to achieve because ground state determination is in general in QMA? Yeah, so if you consider the set of all problems, then this, then this, and, and the worst case complexity, then this ratio cannot be achieved. 
I see. So by I just def so the, then we wouldn't have a talk. Okay. So well, the talk is defined what, what, by what excluding those problems. The, then it would imply that EQA is about the difficulty of state preparation. What I'm confused about is what what you w there's some subtle difference between ground state determination and state preparation. If you say that. No, no, no. So, Sorry. So I'm just I'm just saying that let, let's just um, first define a set of problems which are not glassy. Mm -hmm. So I'm just excluding these things where. where you can't prepare the state. Okay. And then in this remaining set of problems, we're I going see. to study EQA. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Really nice talk. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks a lot for the contest. So I have a question about exponential advantage. Basically, so exponential advantage is kind of with respect to Hilbert space size of the Hilbert space. And let's say, so you show the plot where you have overlap with the ground state for molecules with different number of metal centers. And let's say we have one metal center. And the way I can increase the Hilbert space is by increasing my basis set or active space. Would you expect to have quantum advantage there because the overlap is finite and yeah, is not small? Thank you. You mean just uh, increase the uh, just have the same molecule, but in some sense change the base, the resolution at which you're looking at it. Yeah, let's say. Yeah, so then, then the overlap, have... you, you know, then, you know, physical considerations would tell you that would, you'd expect, of course, anything can happen in principle, but, you know, you'd expect that the overlap is going to stay constant as you just add higher and higher energy states and increase the resolution. Um, but um, you don't expect classical algorithms to be, be exponentially hard in that regime. So. Uh, because you're adding less and less important stuff. So, you know, perturbation theory, uh, for example, would be the right way to describe adding higher and higher energy states to the system. And those, that's not sort of exponentially hard. But even uh, for the strongly correlated systems, like metal-centered yeah, yeah, but you're not adding in strongly correlated degrees of freedom in that sense, right? So in the case when you're increasing the basis resolution, there's a low energy space that might be strongly correlated. That's finite because you have a metal center. And then you're just adding in the sort of weakly coupled continuum degrees of freedom. So you don't expect uh, any particular difficulty there. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so at one point, you stated something along the lines of, like, so this shows that ground state preparation won't work because you showed that the overlap is small. But I'm. Right. I guess what I'm wondering is that, like, the overlap is, well, it's often well motivated, but also it's like an easy way for us to rigorously prove bounds on these fault tolerance yeah. algorithms. I'm wondering whether you think that, like, once we actually have a fault tolerance quantum computer and then we, like, the algorithms might work better than the bounds suggest, or do you think oh, that sure, the sure. simulations show that, like, it's intrinsically no, 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 no. So, so the, the point of that is not to show that you can't prepare the states for Fumoko, so, so, or, or the, the iron sulfur clusters, because you can't even classically produce, I mean, to get that data, I had to sort of classically get a good approximation to the ground state, right? So the idea is that there are good heuristic ways, classically, to prepare, in fact, good ground states for that system. It's just that the same, those same heuristics also determine the energy to the given precision, right? That's, that's the essential problem of advantage. But the, the, your question, though, is, I think, related to heuristics, uh, quantum heuristics. Um, and it's certainly true that all the same information that goes into classical heuristics could be used, perhaps even in a superior form, uh, by deploying quantum heuristics um, for state preparation. Um, and I would expect, you know, all these things that I'm saying you can prepare classically, of course, you can prepare quantumly by using heuristics as well. It just seems like playing field not comparing yeah. analyses. Yeah, I mean, this is how, of course, people discuss quantum chemistry in, in this field, in quantum computing, is usually using, uh, using rigorous uh, quantum algorithms. Um, but um, as I point out here, like quantum heuristics are should be an important part of the problem because they're very powerful. Heuristics are very powerful in physical problems. Um, hi, 
Could you please help me understand the, um, there was a comment about classical heuristics and the error that they produce. Um, I'm not the chemist and I, I don't appreciate, um, is that the error in the energy? This is the error, yeah, so the problem here is just defined as computing the energy, yeah. So it's just the error in the energy for this talk. And it, could the quantum side provide an advantage there in minimizing that error or finding a way to cross-check it against something? Um, so, uh, I mean, depends, okay, so that's maybe more to your question than, uh, it can be interpreted in a way that's very trivial. So here I'm trying to say what's the cost to get to a certain precision. And it, I'm showing there isn't an exponential quantum advantage. Of course, you know, the quantum algorithms, rigorous quantum algorithms can provide various guarantees, for example, or, you know, um, certifications of things. This is not true of heuristics. So there is a sort of difference in the type of confidence you have about error in a, in a provable algorithm versus a heuristic. And for you as a chemist, is that valuable? Again, I, I, I don't appreciate the... Well, I would have said that physical science has developed over the centuries without provable guarantees of anything, right? I mean, experimental <laughs> science does not work that way. So, um, so I think in practice, it hasn't been an important part of the development of physical science to have that provable thing. Of course, you can say, if you had it, would it, would it be changing the course of science? You know, and that's something, I think, for the future to decide. But so far, it hasn't been in, 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 uh, important. Thank you. Okay, well, let's thank our speaker again.